Okay, so it sounds like we are we're ready to start and recording. Hi, this is Marav Fine from the Jewish Funders Network. I'm the program manager here, and I'm really excited about our webinar today. We're going to learn about how alumni make the Jewish world go round. We've got three fantastic professionals um, speaking. We have uh, Sandy Cardin from the Schusterman Family Foundation, uh, actually a Jewish Funders Network board. He was a Jewish Funders Network board member, and um, he's really experienced in this area and is going to be speaking to us about why the Schusterman family thinks it's important to engage in this, this type of work. Um, then we also have Jane Rachel Schoenburn and Rachel Glicksman, both from Avoda. They're going to be talking about um, alumni relations and also uh, foundation relations, respectively, um, and how working with the Schusterman Foundation has been and what the interaction is like, what this new project is going to be about and how it's impacting um, philanthropists most specifically. So without further ado, I know I kind of whizzed through those. Um, so you can see the slides, but everything will be, of course, recorded and sent out to you all so you can watch it and reread it and learn in more depth what all three of these fantastic folks do. Um, so without any further ado, I believe we're starting with Sandy. Yep, that would be great. Thank you very, very much uh, for the introduction, and it's really uh, a privilege uh, to be participating in this in this webinar, and uh, and certainly with our friends at Avoda who do such a terrific job um, in this area of alumni. Um, I was asked and was pleased to to say yes to help sort of frame the conversation this morning about alumni and the importance of alumni. And I want to sort of take us back a little bit um, to a 30,000 foot level and say um, at the foundation when we think about alumni, it's within the context of uh, follow up. Um, and what I mean by the context of follow up is that um, we are all good at doing something, right? We're all involved in, in the activities that we, in which we engage because we're good at getting something done. And we focus on the things that we're good at getting done, whether it's running a trip or running a program or convening a gathering or whatever it may be. And we're very, very good at that. And that's where we focus our attention and that's where we focus the bulk of our resources. And then as an afterthought, or all too often as an afterthought. We say, well, what are we going to do next? What's the next step? What's, how are we going to follow up with those people we just engaged? And uh, for years at the foundation, we asked that question just like everyone else, but we asked it in a way of our grantee partners um, that suggested that they had, um, number one, the resources to do adequate follow-up, Number two, that the financial resources. Number two, that they had personnel that they could devote to doing follow-up or an alumni engagement, whichever way you want to think about it. Um, and three, that they had the expertise. And it turns out that um, after many years of asking this question and being frustrated by virtually every organization we funded, it was obvious why um, it became obvious to us why we were frustrated, and that is because we could ask these organizations this question about what's next is until we were blue in the face, but the fact was that unless they were devoting financial resources, personnel, and developing expertise in this area, they weren't going to be successful. Because what they are best at doing, what organizations are best at doing, is the core activity that they started to do, the mission that they were created to pursue and to fill. So if you run trips to Israel, what you're really good at doing is recruiting people and orienting them and taking them on the trip and providing them with a great experience and making sure they're safe and secure and doing all that you can. And when they come home, um, what you have to do with them next to be effective is a very different set of skills, it takes different skills, it takes different talents, and it takes resources that are generally much more than the small percentage of budgets that organizations allocate to follow-up or alumni activities. Um, because actually, if you think about it, it's sort of counterintuitive. We spend more money on the core activity in which there's no competition, meaning that once we get these people on that activity, there's no place else they're going to go to do that activity. But when they get back, uh, they are now in the general marketplace of ideas. They have millions of things that they can do, and it's harder to get their attention and to get their focus and to provide them with what they want 
once they return and are back in the mainstream than when we have them on the immersive activity or in the particular program. And so to some extent, we as Jewish organizations and service providers generally um, are allocating our time and our resources and our personnel in a, in a sense backwards because we're allocating more of it to the activity in which we have greater control and less of it um, in the sphere in which we have less control and therefore it's harder to get the attention, it's harder um, uh, to engage these people. Now why is it important? And it's important because um, we need, once we've engaged and attracted these people and excited them and, and, and ignited a spark or, or hit a passion, uh, we need to stay with them to help them continue on their journey, whether it be a Jewish journey, whether it be a service journey, whatever kind of service, whatever kind of journey it would be, whatever kind of follow-up. We have helped them form the connection with peers, and in the Jewish case, often with Israel and with Jewish values. These people become the foundation of where we hope our community is going and, and potential leaders of that community. And so as funders, we need to help the organizations devote time and resources to helping these people continue on their journey and to continue to be engaged, continue to be excited and motivated and inspired so that when all the other rest of the world comes around them, they still are focused on living Jewish lives uh, and raising Jewish children. So w there are some things in the education field when you think about higher education and certainly in private education, but even public education, where they've done some good ideas and implemented some good strategies and strong strategies on how to be remain engaged and to in, have alumni engagement. We have to um, we have to do that as well in the Jewish community. We have to be as if not more sophisticated than uh, secular organizations as to how best to connect to and uh, motivate and inspire and engage our alumni. Now it's easier said than done, for sure. Like I said, the well, first step is we need to allocate resources, find a personnel, and be sure we have the talent and skills to do that. And, and, and then once we've done that, then we have to figure out, then, we, then the hard part, the real hard part comes, which is the implementation of it. Now several years ago, we ran a five-part webinar series with Jim Joseph on the topic of alumni engagement, hundreds of people participated, and it was clear then, as it is to us now, that this is a very important topic. And essentially, it, it is the topic because it's what we're talking about, how do we remain engaged with all the people we're, we're touching today, and how do we build our future. We at the foundation understood this, and that's why several years ago we began a process that ended up culminated in the and the publication of our alumni playbook because we wanted to help fill the gap in the field and spark conversation and collaboration about how the several organizations, including Avoda, were doing alumni follow-up and doing um, this kind of continuing contact in a, in a very effective way. It became clear to us as we were doing this work that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to alumni engagement. There, ha there are some things that are true for all organizations and for all follow-up strategies, but obviously they have to be tailored both to meet the participants and to address the follow-up of the activity that was involved, that sort of first touch. The second touch has to be, um, has to be created in such a way and molded in such a way that it, that it amplifies um, that first touch. So uh, just uh, as a bottom line, we, we just, uh, times are too challenging now, and they were even too challenging before, uh, for us to leave the young adults that we're reaching on these first-time experiences out in the cold and not finding ways to engage them and to help them continue their journeys. Organizations can't do it by themselves. They need resources. They need financial help. They need additional personnel. They need to be um, given professional development so they have the skills and talents necessary to do alumni follow-up. We as funders have to be sure that we appreciate, fully appreciate what this takes. We can't afford, literally and figuratively, to treat this as an afterthought. It has to be a fundamental piece of organizational policy and organizational budgets. We have to make this a habit of saying, when we're going to fund a first experience or a first touch experience, what are we going to do second touch, third touch, fourth touch, or else we're not getting the return on investment that we want from that initial, initial contact. 
I invite all of you to be in touch and to share your ideas and feedback on our alumni playbook. There's more that we want to bring to this conversation and so much more that we can learn from all of you. We're eager to continue the conversation and to play a role of convener and um, a collaborator in trying to help this move this conversation forward and to engage as many organizations and as many people as possible. So thank you all again very much for taking the time of your schedule to participate in this webinar. And I'd like to invite our friends at the Stellar Avoda team to talk to us about their alumni program. Yeah. Oh, hi. All right, uh, this is Jane Rachel Schoenbrunn. I'm the Director of Foundation Relations at Avoda. Um, and I first off just wanted to thank um, JFN and the Schusterman Foundation and Sandy for inviting us to be a part of this. Uh, we've been really grateful to the, for the Schusterman Foundation support of our alumni work um, and thrilled to have been included as a case study in the alumni playbook. Um, we're also excited today to build on what Sandy was sharing about engaging alumni and tell you a little bit more about our strategy at Avoda. Um, I speak to this from a very personal perspective. I have been on staff at Avoda um, as a part of our development team for five years, but I am, in fact, um, a, a, most importantly, an Avoda alumna. I was a participant in the second cohort of the program um, uh, quite a while ago and um, was thrilled to have the opportunity to um, bring my work uh, back to supporting the organization five years ago. Um, and let me introduce Rachel Glixman, my colleague who's here with me as well. Hi, um, so I am also an alum of Avoda. I was a core member in New Orleans from 2009 to 2010 um, and stayed involved as an alumni leader. I was um, a network weaver, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and on our advisory council in New Orleans before joining the staff um, first in New Orleans and then um, working with our New York Service Corps. And finally, um, a few months ago, I transitioned into the role of alumni director, and I'm excited to share more about our strategy and work with you today. Uh, before we go further, we just want to make sure to share a little more about who we are in case everyone's not familiar with Avoda. Um, our mission, as you can see on the slide here, is to strengthen the Jewish community's fight against the causes and effects of poverty in the United States. And we do this by engaging young Jewish adults post-college in service and community building um, with the real intention of inspiring them to become lifelong leaders whose work for justice and social change is rooted in and nourished by Jewish values. Um, and we started in 1998, uh, where we were founded as a Jewish service corps, started with nine participants living collectively in a house in Brooklyn. These are some photos here of our first cohort on the right and our second cohort on the left. Um, the core members were placed in full-time positions in local anti-poverty agencies and participated in week weekly learning programs together. We've grown quite a bit over the past 18 years. Uh, our service corps has expanded beyond uh, New York to Chicago, New Orleans, and Washington, D.C. We now have 70 to 75 full-time corps members each year. Um, and in uh, over the past uh, 18 years, our core members have added almost $15 million in capacity to our partner agencies and also help bring critical services to more than 588,000 individuals living in poverty. In addition, uh, to reach a new population and to expand our impact, in 2014 we launched a new fellowship program targeting early career professionals, um, and it's now, which is now in our, its third cohort in New York and expanding to Chicago in January. Um, so I'm going to hand it back to Rachel to give you an overview of our alumni community. So um, we now, from all these 18 years from both our service corps and our fellowship, we now have over 800 alumni um, who live around the country and around the world. Um, many of them are clustered in our program cities in New York, D.C., Chicago, and New Orleans. Um, but we also have fairly large alumni communities in Boston, in the Bay Area, in Philadelphia, and in Israel. Um, and as you can see from the slide, um, many of them, 70%, have remained in the social justice world, um, working at anti-poverty or social service organizations. Some are doctors or lawyers or teachers um, or social workers. Um, and 24% of them currently work for a Jewish organization. 
Um, and also 85% say that they found their place in the Jewish community through Avodah. Uh, many are actively involved in synagogues or are the leader of an independent minion. Um, some are actively involved as organizers with Jewish social justice campaigns or have found their own um, Jewish path within the um, Avodah community. So what we've learned through all of this time, um, and clearly I've been working in the alumni role for only a few months, so this is sort of some of our um, combined history. Um, from the beginning, our alumni have stayed close with one another. Our immersive program, as Jane Rachel and I can speak to personally, really yields deep relationships and communities um, that our alumni continue to seek out after they continue and after they've completed the program. Um, many of them continue to live together with other alumni um, or nearby. Uh, recently, I was in Washington, D.C. talking to some of our alumni, and they told me that there's one block, and on each, each of the four sides of that block, there's a house of Avodah alumni, um, and they regularly get together for Shabbat dinners, and it was around the high holidays, and they had recently, I think, had a, um, had a gathering then. Um, and the connection really also goes beyond the social. Um, it is a powerful network to draw on for knowledge. We have a very, very active alumni listserv, and there's constant postings both for jobs and housing, but also conversations for um, reaching out for, um, net for resources related to their jobs, finding out good organizations, looking for different, um, sharing different articles. And beyond the strong social aspect for many in our community, Avodah is their Jewish community. Um, we often have alumni share that for one reason or another, they had yet to find a Jewish community whose values had resonated with theirs before joining our program. And in Avodah, they found uh, like-minded individuals who had a shared vision for the Jewish community. So alumni turned to one another for resources for life cycle events to learn about when they moved to a new city, to learn about which synagogues or Jewish communities they should join, um, and they joined together for holiday celebrations. Um, but really, we found out that if we look back at our mission, um, which Jane Rachel shared a little bit earlier, to strengthen the Jewish community's fight against the causes and effects of poverty um, by creating lifelong leaders, we need to realize this mission is lived out, is realized um, in our alumni community. So while we put a lot of time and effort, as Sandy said, into crafting strong programs that train these leaders, we really need to continue to support um, and work with our alumni as they carry out the crucial work that we are seeking to do as an organization. So right now our strategy has four um, key components. Um, and I'll give some examples on the next slide about what this looks like. So the overview is that we um, seek to maintain and strengthen connections between our alumni to keep our community going um, and continue to build and strengthen new relationships between the members of our ever-growing community. We provide leadership and social change skills, um, both so that their individual work is strengthened or so that our alumni are doing, continue doing the wonderful work they're doing, um, and that they're also successful leaders and, uh, um, in Jewish communities and other social justice communities so they can continue to um, affect change as part of Avodah. Um, also, as part of realizing our mission, as I mentioned before, we want to help alumni find spaces of leadership, both jobs and lay leader positions in the Jewish community, um, and work in partnership with them for community engagement. Um, so going into different Jewish communal spaces and teaching or speaking or training about social justice work. Um, and we also seek to engage um, alumni in support of Avodah as an organization. So what this looks like, um, these are a few of our many different tactics that we use. Um, so I mentioned earlier that when I finished um, my year as a core member, I became a network weaver in New Orleans. Um, I believe the network weaver program started um, four or five years ago. And network weavers are alumni leaders in each of our program cities. Um, they're paid a small stipend, and we also give them a modest program budget to create both social and educational programming for their local alumni community. Um, this year, I also decided in conversation with them 
um, to give them a small budget for coffee dates or for other meetings to encourage them to be our eyes and ears on the ground in each city um, to get a sense of what are alumni looking for and um, really reaching out to them and designing program programming that's interesting um, to them and has the kind of events and support they're, they're looking for. Um, Avoda Women Leading Together, we're now in our second um, year of that, and actually we're going to go have a, a whole slide about that later, so I'm going to skip over that now. Um, we give micro grants um, for alumni, often in non-hub cities, um, to do programmatic work both with their local alumni community and in the Jewish community um, at large. So for example, in Boston last year, a few of our alumni convened several conversations on Judaism and racial justice. We also provide meal subsidies around the high holidays and around Passover particularly um, for alumni to invite other members of the community as well as friends to share a holiday meal together and to reflect on and share social justice themes related to that holiday. Um, so just over Rosh Hashanah um, and Yom Kippur, so, um, we hosted 12 meals across the country and there were about 250 participants in those meals. Some of them were alumni and some were friends who are looking for a Jewish social justice space to come together. Um, we offer our core members to be paired with an alumni mentor who can support them throughout the year. Um, some of it is just having someone who's gone through that experience who can talk to them um, when they're feeling challenged at work or in their community. Um, and some of it is to have someone who can talk through some professional next steps. We really try to um, pair people with someone who we think they'll they'll get along with, who has similar experiences, and hopefully a similar, um, has a career trajectory that they're interested in. Um, our alumni work on fundraising campaigns, um, as well as our fundraising events. And we also ask our core members, our incoming core members, when they're starting the program, we ask them to um, fundraise for Avoda. And so we have incoming core member fundraising liaisons who are all alumni who have done that before, who fundraised when they were joining Avoda, and they are sort of cheerleaders for them as well as mentors for them throughout that whole process. Um, we look at our program staff, we look to our program staff in all of our cities to first seek when they're looking for a speaker or for a trainer, um, to look into our alumni network. We have so many alumni, many of whom are skilled um, educators or trainers or social justice professionals. Um, and really to see are they available um, to do any of the training work that we bring in external speakers for. Um, we also know that our fundraisers, our alumni are our best ambassadors for our program. Um, so we work with alumni to reach out to their communities to recruit future participants. Um, and we have found that 65 to 70 percent of our applicants say that they were referred by an alumni or current participant of our program. And this isn't on the slide, but um, last but not least, what we're really working to amp up, um, particularly over the next few months, is our community engagement work. Um, so as I mentioned on the previous slide, we are um, one of our key strategies is to place, and, um, place our alumni in uh, spaces in the Jewish community so that they can be doing social justice work and bring our social justice lens to the broader Jewish world. Um, and we're doing, we have some upcoming workshops at different, um, in different youth groups um, with different federations in different cities. And it's something as I've had conversations with our alumni as I'm sharing our strategy and getting feedback and finding out what they're looking for, um, that is one area that a lot of our alumni have really um, expressed interest in. And I'm looking forward to devising a strategy with them and working with them um, to um, really get our message out into the broader world. So I'm going to hand it back over to Jane Rachel is going to start us off. We're going to go through some examples a little bit more in depth of um, how our strategy plays out on the ground. Uh, so again, I know Rachel just threw a lot out there. We're really trying many, many tactics to work with our alumni community, and some of them are new. We're constantly innovating, um, both in terms of um, things that we're hearing from the alumni network that ways to better meet their needs um, and also just trying to seek out any kind of new opportunities we can to strengthen the network to um, and to strengthen and keep those folks engaged. Um, so again, we're, we wanted to pull out a few specific examples just to illustrate it a little bit more. Um, 
Uh, we'll start here with our Alumni Leadership Institute that happened last in 2013. Uh, the context is that for years, Avadaz um, hosted an annual national alumni retreat. And these gatherings played a really important role. They helped build, strengthen, and sustain participant relationships, both across the different cities and across the different program years. Uh, unfortunately, due to the economic downturn, Avada had to make some budgetary adjustments, and in 2009, these retreats were discontinued. Uh, but there, and throughout that whole time, we continued to have lots of local and regional activities. But we, from a staff organizational standpoint, and also from what we were hearing time and time again from our alumni network, we're, we're really missing um, a, an immersive and tangible way to help our alumni feel a part of the larger national network. So after five years without an alumni retreat, um, we were really excited that in 2013 we secured uh, specific funding for um, this new alumni leadership initiative. Um, and uh, the institute, excuse me, um, and it was really a great success. It brought together a diverse group of Avada alumni, including alumni from across um, all four of the program cities and from 29 out of our 38 cohorts, um, so really um, very representative. They came from 18 cities across the United States, uh, the largest clusters from our four cities, New York, D.C., Chicago, and New Orleans, and also um, from Canada and Israel. And the program itself provided participants with both uh, an intensive program of skill building and, expo and issue exploration, but also some very critical relationship building. Um, and a side note about the programming we did, uh, and this sort of goes back to what Rachel was saying, uh, looking at our alumni themselves as resources, when we became, began planning for the institute, we started looking for people who could come in and teach and facilitate sessions and learning on a whole host of topics, and we realized very quickly that we had so much wisdom and expertise within our alumni community, uh, and we were really proud that we were ultimately able to plan the whole three-day program with the alumni facilitating or leading nearly all of the programming. Um, you know, the reality is, at this point, we're a 17-year-old organization, so um, many of our alumni have been through graduate school, working in their fields for a long time, and at this alumni retreat, we had very experienced social workers, educators, Jewish communal professionals, organizers, doctors, advocates, policymakers, um, and other nonprofit and Jewish community leaders. Overall, the retreat really helped prepare the people who were in attendance to build a stronger network. Uh, it helped them establish new relationships and to sustain and renew old relationships and to think in a very productive way about how the alumni community as a much larger, more powerful force can work together going forward. Um, and uh, one, of our, one of our alumni, uh, Emma Epstein, who's from D.C., she wrote in her evaluation, we need opportunities to reconnect in physical space and spirit in order to maintain our commitment to the cause and to each other. This was a beautiful opportunity to move forward as a network and also reflect on our past common experiences. I think that just really um, shows exactly what I was trying to explain. Um, and just one example of an outgrowth of this, um, uh, you know, and there were a number of different things that came up, but one thing that happened while we were at the Institute was a subgroup uh, there convened a caucus um, that was focused on making Avodah's program more LGBTQ friendly and also um, to better meeting the needs of the LGBTQ alumni. Um, and following that, there was um, you know, some really nice things that came after the retreat where both a small group of representatives from this caucus sat together with Avodah's leadership to talk about ways we could address some of the challenges or some of the opportunities um, that were raised at the retreat. They also then started an LGBTQ listserv um, for Avodah alumni um, and planned um, several follow-up events, including a gathering in D.C., a Shabbat dinner in New York, um, and that was something we were really excited came from this national cross-class, cross-city collaboration and opportunity. So an example of um, some of our local programming was our New York Alumni Story Slam, which was this past um, 
um, August this past year. Um, and actually, this was inspired um, by a program at our 2013 retreat. So Brittany Ricker, who is the woman on the right in your slide, she attended the 2013 retreat when she was still a core member. We invited some core members as a way to really integrate them into our alumni community while they were still in the program. And she had said, she said to me um, over the summer, you know, the highlight from the store, from the retreat was the story slam we had at one night. We had, you know, the hundred alums who were there sat in a circle and for hours just shared funny stories and challenging stories and heartwarming stories from um, when from their Avoda year. Um, and it really bonded and brought people together. And she said, "What would that look like if we did something like that here in New York for our alumni community?" Um, so she. Um, brought, she had this idea and we talked a little bit about it and she really, um, we provided with her with some support, but she really ran with it. She found a space at a bookstore in Manhattan. She recruited um, alumni to tell their stories. She talked, she um, worked with them to develop their stories. Um, and the theme was on bodies. Um, it was really broadly defined. It was on physical bodies. It was on bodies of people on kind of um, organizations. Um, and we had um, six different storytellers and over 50 um, alumni and current participants. Um, and I think it was, you know, one of the really great things about it, um, both was that it was a, um, an alum who had this idea and she ran with it using, you know, a little bit of staff support and, um, but really developed it on her own. Um, and she also, it was a great, inter it was during our, happened to be during our orientation for our core members. Um, and it was a wonderful introduction for them to the alumni community and helped them to feel part of an active and vibrant um, Avoda network from the beginning. And many of them said to me, um, you know, the core members came up and said, I want to go to all the alumni events. I want to really be part of this network. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things we talked, I know, is, is in the alumni playbook is a lot around um, lifting up what alumni, you know, starting with what alumni are interested in and lifting up what they're interested in um, and doing and having them run their own programming, and this is a really wonderful example of that. Um, so another example that I mentioned um, earlier is Avoda Women Leading Together. Um, and this is a more immersive, intensive program that we're running virtually. We're in our second year. Um, and it came about because we noticed that while there's a lot of talk in the Jewish community about supporting Jewish women leaders, um, we, we have always had a lot of women in our program. Our program is primarily, um, I would say, a great majority of our participants are women. Um, and we've chosen to see that both as a strength and as an opportunity, um, especially because of the, way, the conversations in the Jewish community related to um, supporting Jewish women leaders. So Jen Walfer Roberts, who was an alumna from our first year, um, had become a professional coach, and she had developed a model of coaching circles for mission-driven women called Women Leaders Emerging. Um, she had a lot, she's had a lot of participants over the years and would always send something out about it to our listserv. Um, and it was an intensive program and it also was quite expensive because of it's, a, you know, because coaching can be expensive, it was an immersive intensive program. Um, so in collaboration with Jen, we saw the potential to create a version of this for Avoja um, alumni. And we created Avoja Women Leading Together a virtual program that combines individual coaching with Jen, um, personal work that helps women identify their mission, their vision for their own future, understand their strengths, and create a personal strategic plan for themselves. And then they have monthly seminars um, on relevant topics as well as partners in this experience. They have small, a small group cohort um, as well as a partner they meet with on a, week, on a weekly basis that help them um, over the course of the seven months of the program, help them follow through on some of their goals and really work through a lot of the goals they're, um, they're identifying through their strategic plan process. Um, the program is specialized for Avoda um, alumni in that it weaves in Jewish and social justice themes. Um, for example, this past month we worked on um, all the women in the program were identifying their strengths and they looked into the Jewish Women's Archive and looked at um, historical Jewish women leaders who shared their same strengths and thought about themselves as part of a conversation of historic Jewish women leaders. Um, and I am proud to say that I was a participant in the first cohort. Um, being part of it actually was part of my journey in identifying that I would want to be our alumni director. 
Um, and we're currently, as I said, in our second cohort. Um, we have a national cohort as well as we have an in-person cohort of um, women who are in D.C. The, the final example here, we just wanted to um, focus on one individual. Um, we could probably give you dozens and dozens of stories um, that are very similar, but we thought Shana was a great recent example. Um, she is a, was a member of Avada's first fellowship cohort just a couple years ago. And at the time, that uh, a reminder, that program is for early career professionals. And she was working as a social worker and a case planner at the Jewish Child Care Association. And she started um, realizing through her participation in the fellowship and afterwards that it was time for her to um, look for her next career opportunity. And she reached out to our director of alumni engagement, um, Rachel's predecessor, Rabbi Stephanie Rusquet, who referred her to an open position at UJA Federation of New York. Uh, and Stephanie knew about the position because UJA Federation had reached out to her with the position listing because so many times they had received um, high quality candidates from Avada's alumni network. So they felt like we were a great um, place to try to seek out their next professional. So Stephanie made the connection, and when Shana applied, uh, Stephanie endorsed her candidacy and emphasized the value of the Avada lens Shana would bring to her work. And the great news was that Shana successfully secured this position and has been, for the last couple of years, working as the initiative's program manager. Uh, but the best part is not just that Shana got this job, but what she did is she, when she started working there, she was immediately tasked with a project that brought together a cohort of synagogue professionals and lay leaders to learn more about service, social justice, and Jewish connections, um, and, to imp and to help these synagogue professionals implement a more significant service program in their own communities. And Shana immediately decided to call on Avoda to bring us in as consultants to help her plan and execute the learning sessions. Um, and we did this with, um, in addition to a couple of other organizations who she called on, um, and our staff and alumni ended up working with her um, as a part of teaching the group and helping the synagogue professionals turn their ideas into a plan for service in their communities. And the reason I wanted to bring this example was because not only is Shana's whole story a great example of the ways we're supporting our alumni as they move forward as leaders, but it's also a great illustration of the ways our alumni are bringing Avodah's mission and the lens they gain through their Avodah experience into the broader Jewish community. So some of our, our key takeaways from all of this um, is that there's no one-size-fits-all plan for alumni engagement. Um, and particularly something I've learned as I've um, entered into this role is that different tactics will and should evolve. I've looked through what we've done over the past um, 18 years with our alumni and as I'm planning for you know, different paths now and especially realizing right now we have alumni in, who are in a very broad age range who are in different life stages and they have different um, needs and that will continue to shape, to you know, grow and change as we grow as an organization. Um, we realize that alumni engagement begins even before participants become alumni. We really need to uh, lay the seeds, lay the groundwork when um, participants are, are you know, part of our core program so that they're engaged and they're excited and they feel part of the um, alumni network. I know one of the small changes we made a few years ago was putting our, alum, our core members on our alumni listserv so they got all the the wonderful messages and announcements, um, but it's really been a shift definitely over the past few years to seeing our um, alumni or our, our participants the second they walk in that they're part, they're ready part and parcel of the Avoda community. Um, that alumni should create and lead their own programming whenever possible, that really we want to, they have a lot of great ideas, they want to connect with each other, and really our role is to lift that up and to um, bring that, you know, give them the resources and the support they need to um, bring that into action. Um, and that regular in-person convenings are really crucial. Um, Jane Rachel talked about our 2013 convening. Um, it was really wonderful, and it can be, um, can often be expensive and cost prohibited. That has been the um, issue for us as an organization. Um, but it can also happen on a smaller scale. And what you see below this little slightly silly photo here is the, the first cohort of Avodanics with their families this past summer. Um, they all got together, I think, in a cabin just outside of D.C. 
um, and really they, they knew that they wanted to come together. And I think you can't see their, their T-shirts, but it has something about uh, Avodah families being together. And it's really a wonderful example of our, our alumni, um, how they stay together and how they're really living out their, their values in the world. Um, so that's the end of our formal presentation. And um, we just want to thank you again for having us as a part of this and would love to um, answer any questions uh, about our work and our experiences. Thank you guys. That was great. Um, I think we all learned a lot about the best ways to engage alumni um, and also about the specifics of what Avodah does. So we've actually had this great week of learning a lot about what Avodah does and how they do it. Um, and why it works, because we also had a call with you guys earlier this week uh, talking about your fellowship model. Um, so I've unmuted everyone on the call right now, so if you'd like to ask a specific question for, of any of the presenters, you can do that at your leisure. Hello. So one question is um, maybe more for uh, Sandy. Um, as a, you spoke a little bit um, at the beginning about um, why Schusterman is so excited about this work and why you're committed to it. Do you have any thoughts to share with other philanthropists, other funders? who are looking to do this about best practices for engaging with your grantees on this level. It seems like Avodah has a really sophisticated, at this point, um, structure. But in terms of starting that conversation, like how that went, what the, what the back end of that looked like from your guys' perspective? Sure. Um, <clears throat> look, I think it goes back to what I, I tried to explain at the opening. I think when it comes to funders, responsible philanthropy is, uh, is it requires that any conversation that you have about alumni and follow-up be moved from the afterthought category into a main priority. Um, I just think for years, uh, funders and, and to some extent the service providers, you know, focus on their main activity and then they say, we'll get the follow-up or alumni and we'll do that later and we can get away with doing that and allocating some small part of the budget to it and, um, and then just sort of dealing with it. I think that as we move forward that the, the, this whole notion of alumni engagement, follow-up, next steps, whatever you want to call it, needs to be a bucket which is given as much priority um, and as much attention and resource um, as necessary to, as the core activity, the initial activity. Because the initial activity, we know the re the, what results from the original activity or what you gain from the original activity is going to be lost over time. And it's much, much less expensive, we know, to do retention than it is to bring in new people. And so I think from a funder's perspective, we need to think about alumni engagement and retention of people that we've already touched as not sort of a, just a throwaway or an afterthought, but it needs to be front and center of the organization's mission and their budget as you think about it. And I think funders can't expect, uh, to, to, put the, to put a blame on funders, I think that for years funders expected that organizations should um, be, have viable alumni and follow-up programming just on their core budgets and not, um, and not require and not need additional funding and support to do it. I think funders have to realize that is an unrealistic perspective and funders need to step up to the plate and increase their funding of organizations about which they care deeply to make sure they can do follow-up in a meaningful way. It's going to cost more money, but the benefit's going to be tremendous. Thank you so much, Sandy. That's um, a great perspective to hear, uh, particularly from, from a funder, the understanding that actually uh, organizations need the same amount of support, um, if not more, for alumni. That's really interesting and certainly not the model that, that most folks use 
Um, well, one, one other point I would add to that is that those, those folks who are sort of following trends in the philanthropic community, sort of one of the, well, the, obviously the most recent is uh, the Zuckerberg-Chan kind of thing, which will, which will yield some interesting conversations. But the other is this, which, which sort of relates to that, is this notion of placing big bets. I don't know how many folks have been following in the media and the philanthropic media and so forth, this whole question of organizations that used to make large, uh, a, a, a significant number of grants are now saying the way to do things is to make uh, fewer grants but bigger bets. And what I would suggest is that um, this, what we're talking about today, actually fits perfectly into this trend of bigger bets. It's not that you need to just put more money into an organization for it to continue doing what it's doing or to expand its current activities. It may be that that's a good thing, but there's no question that making a bigger bet and allowing the organization to have a longer tail is going to benefit um, is going to be beneficial to the organization and the participants. So as long as funders are talking about increasing, making a smaller number of grant and smaller number of grants, but a larger amount and bigger bets. Part of that big bet needs to be sufficient funding and attention to alumni engagement and uh, follow-up. Thank you. Um, a question by way of follow-up for that for uh, the folks at Avoda, um, as a, from a grantee's perspective, what what did this process look like in terms of going um, using the Schusterman Alumni Playbook? To what extent um, did you use it? Do you have any any tips for folks who are trying to use it moving forward? Uh, so, look, we're trying to present our work in a way like Sandy's describing. We're trying to um, elevate our focus on alumni and it's make it clear to our funders and prospective funders that this is not just an afterthought or an add-on, that it's really so central to our mission and maybe even the most important part of our work because we have people in our, in our programs for a discrete amount of time, but our mission is really about lifelong leaders. And so in order to uh, reach that mission, we need to continue this support. And so uh, the, the playbook is a relatively new resource, but it's uh, really a uh, boon to us and something that we uh, will continue to use to um, speak with funders about exactly what Sandy was saying, how much we need to um, continue our investment, and really any our continuing funders who for many years have been fun supporting Avoda, um, this is the way that we're really going to maximize the deep investment that they've made in our work and that we've made in our participants um, through this long-term uh, ongoing investment. And I would say the other piece is, uh, so the playbook came out um, a few months ago as I was transitioning into this, um, into this new role, and I attended the, the webinar on it, and I remember one of the key takeaways for me was really on um, starting from where alumni are and designing programming that, that um, is in response to their needs, and that's really infused my strategy. Um, I have done a lot of, you know, made a big effort in having phone calls and coffee meetings with alumni across the country, across, you know, different age ranges and in different places, and really trying to, to both ask what are you looking for and what do you want to do, and sort of um, only putting our energy, focusing our energy on where alumni want us to go was definitely um, one of the key takeaways from the playbook and has really helped to, to guide our alumni strategy. Right, so really design thinking for alumni is, is yeah. what I'm hearing a lot about. From, mm -hmm. from this um, from this presentation yeah wonderful so I I think there is one last contact slide maybe um, for folks to take a look at uh, if you want to get in touch with uh, the folks at Avoda you can do that the folks at Schusterman um, this again will be posted on our Facebook it will be posted on our website um, if you have questions that either Avoda or Schusterman can't answer for you, I am happy to answer those questions. Um, again, I'm Mara Fine. I'm the Program Manager at the Jewish Funders Network. It is my distinct pleasure to work with funders in our network to help them to tell the world about the great work that they're supporting and the great work that they are excited and interested in. Um, and I think we are... We're done for today, so thank you all for spending the hour with us this afternoon. 
Uh, thank you so much to Sandy, to Rachel, to Jane, Rachel, also to Erica Mandel, who has silently been here um, listening and has been really instrumental in putting all of this together. It was, it was really great to learn with you all today, and I look forward to meeting you all, seeing you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, all. Have a great Bye. day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.